<laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Charles from GMAT Ninja, uh, GMAT Club's verbal expert. And today we're going to be doing more quant. This is Verbal Boot Camp Part 3. I'm actually really excited about today's because it's uh, we get to talk about long, wordy GMAT quant questions. Because one of the things I hear all the time from people is, oh, wow, that question's so wordy. Uh, and there's kind of this panic and and there's, there's you know, variables flying everywhere and it gets really ugly. So that's one thing I hear all the time. Another thing is, whoa, 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 I didn't study that thing because the GMAT sometimes makes up things uh, that are kind of function questions or they make up terminology or they they pull out some obscure terminology. So basically, today's all about those questions that are either so long that they're intimidating or so strange that they're intimidating because there's some symbols or some terminology you've never seen before in all of your math studies. So this is what today's video is about, is learning how to not be intimidated by these things. Um, and again, this is series three, video number, what are we up to now? I think this is video number five in this series. Uh, so we're here 8.30 Tuesdays and Fridays this week and next week. And once again, if you're not watching this live, this is live. No second takes, no edits, no control Z button, no back button. You get to rewind and fast forward. I don't. So uh, apologies for any errors. All right. So I've got a, a little story about uh, some data that I, I dug up some years ago about uh, length of questions on the GMAT and other exams. Let's jump in. Let me give you guys a question first. Maybe we'll get through two. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about kind of the big picture of how the exam's constructed. Uh, and then we'll go through, do about nine examples today. So, all right. Let me get my screen shared. And once again, if this is your first time joining a live broadcast, uh, please, please uh, don't be shy. We want to hear your feedback. We want to hear your comments. Absolutely want to hear your answers. So as you're looking at this, as soon as you have an answer, go ahead and pop it up on the screen. I'm following that on a separate tablet. Um, helps me enormously. Again, I'm used to tutoring people one on one. For me, this is an hour of not hearing any voices back at me. All I have is a chat. So please give me your feedback. If you're struggling, let us know. If you're stumped, let us know. Again, please don't be shy if you're going against the grain. We'd love to see that. All right, starting to get some agreement from the group. Awesome. Noticing people are pretty slow with their responses. Pretty typical on this stuff. Okay, so actually, before we solve this question, um, tell you guys a little story about some data I ran into. Um, 
somewhat embarrassing. I got halfway through a PhD in psychometrics, among other things, which is the science underneath standardized testing. So I know way too much about test construction, how it works. I ran into a study once that uh, basically got into this idea of what's the correlation between the length of questions as in how long it takes people to do them and the difficulty. So you can think of difficulty as something that's determined by testing all those experimental questions you see on the GMAT. That's the GMAT figuring out how hard are these questions. So you can say that every question has a number attached to it, a difficulty level, and then there's an average length that takes people to do it, right? I would imagine that those two things are correlated positively. Harder it is, the longer it takes, right? Makes total sense, totally intuitive, been teaching for 20 years. Obviously that's gonna be the case, right? So somebody actually went and collected the data on a bunch of major standardized tests and figured out that yes, that's true. Length and difficulty, positively correlated, SAT, ACT, ASVAB, which is an armed forces entrance exam. There was one exception, guess what it was? The GMAT. Now, it wasn't a very strong negative correlation, but it turned out that on the GMAT, the longer it took people to do the question on average, the easier it was, just by a little bit on average. Don't take that too, too seriously. But that kind of makes sense. As you look at the way the GMAT's constructed, look at this question. It's this word soup. It looks like a Russian novel. It goes on forever and ever and ever. It's easy to misread. Now, if you look at that question right off the bat and you immediately just start going, oh, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to start writing stuff down. I'm going to write stuff down. There's a nine. There's a twelve. There's a there's a half. There's a 50 cents. Ah, you get yourself into trouble. But what I always want you guys to do on these questions, if you have watched my other quant videos, you've heard me say this. Read the question twice. Take a deep breath. Think through what you're doing first. Plot your path before you jump in. That's how you get efficient. That's how you save time. So in this case, I'm just going to set up a little chart. Uh, so we've got the cheaper tickets. They start at $9. Uh, and what's the price of those? Well, it's half the price plus 50 cents with the discount. So that makes it five bucks. We've got the expensive tickets. And I'm going to hang off on filling this in for a second. Those start at 12 bucks. And the final price of those is going to be uh, half that plus a buck. So we get $7. And what's the total number of tickets sold here? Well, there's total of Y tickets grand total. So the total number of expensive tickets has to be Y minus X. And now we're in business, right? So we want to know the total cost of all of these tickets. So it's going to be 5X. There's the total cost here. 7Y minus X. 5x plus 7y minus 7x, and that's going to give us 7y minus 2x. Awesome, nice and straightforward. And again, the key here is you want to take a breath before you jump in. And just as importantly, one of the things I hear from people all the time on their tests, oh yeah, once I get under time pressure, if it's really long, I skip it. If it's really long, I skip it. It's just, it's too much for me to read. Hey, take it easy. Usually, not always, but usually on these really long questions, if you take the time to read it, once you get through that part, it might take a little bit longer, the rest of it's quite a bit easier. It certainly doesn't take as long. Very much part of the construction of the test. Why do they do it that way? Not really sure. I can, can give you a whole bunch of conjecture on it. Bottom line, don't be intimidated just because a question's long. Okay, that was our warm up. Let's get some harder ones cooking. This next one isn't too bad, still warming up a little bit. And the reaction I get to this one quite a bit is, ah, I haven't studied that symbol. Uh, I don't know what that symbol means. I understand that, but that wasn't in my test prep book. Give you guys a minute or two. And once again, if you're just joining us, as soon as you have an answer, go ahead and spit it out on that chat screen. Kevin, good to see you. All right, fantastic. Getting lots of agreement here. 
Makes me happy. And again, still warming up. Nothing's too hard about this one. Actually, most of the ones we're going to do today, very deliberately, not that bad on the math because it's kind of the point, right? You look at the question and go, oh, good Lord, I've never seen that simple. I've never studied it. Fine. No big deal. Follow their directions. That's what they're testing you on. It's a function question, right? Follow the directions. Okay. X inside little brackety thingies is the greatest integer that's less than or equal to X. I'm going to start with the easy ones that are positive because those don't hurt my brain as much. Greatest integer less than. Okay, that's going to be a three here. 3.4 rounds down to three. Basically, we're saying round down to the nearest integer. So this is negative one. <laughs> Just kidding. So watch out for that negative. Uh, greatest integer less than negative 1.6 is going to be negative two. Um, really nice work on the live group. I don't think anybody made that mistake. Or if you did, you didn't tell me about it. And your answer is five. No big deal. All right, let's roll into another one. Um, and one question I had, by the way, on the previous uh, previous question where I set up that little table, um, somebody asked, like, how did you know to set up that table? Um, and that's a really good question. Um, I'm not going to argue. I don't think that there are cases where I would say, oh, you should always set up a table. The table does something magical. It doesn't really. Um, all that is is a way for me to say, well, let me think about it. There's two different kinds of tickets. It didn't need to look like a table on that last one. But it's like, well, I got two kinds of tickets. I got the cheap ones and I got the expensive ones. And it's like, well, what do I need to know about all these things? I'm just trying to find ways to organize my information. I've got two kinds of tickets. And that's what sort of inspired me to line these up. It's a habit that kind of over time you build, um, that you kind of look at some of these word problems. If you watched last week's on age problems and rate problems, we often kind of have them organized in little tables. And again, it's not that there's any particular table. Memorize this table. It's just the idea that whenever you can find a way to organize something in a really clean way, you want to try to do it. Over time, I think if you're conscious of that, it becomes a little bit more natural and you might apply that in more places. All right, it's three. <laughs> yes, thank you to everybody who is pointing out that I totally added this up wrong and it is indeed three. Like I said, I don't get a rewind button, make mistakes all the time. Important thing is you catch them, do as I say, not as I do. Thank you, everybody. That's embarrassing. All right, next question. And this is why you don't want to talk to yourself while you're taking the GMAT. All right, number three, one of my favorites, just because it scares people. This is your geometry test for today. And I apologize, everybody. I just realized there's a, um, a little typo in the question. Uh, and I'm wondering if I should just pull the plug on this question. I think that's supposed to be 3 fourths pi r cubed, I believe. Actually, you know what? I'm going to make the call here because um, I apologize. I, I'm seeing a typo here, and I'm not totally sure what it's supposed to be because I don't think this is going to add up. I'm going to go on to the next question. So sorry about that. I'm going to take a look at number four here.
And again, if you're stumped or feeling intimidated or wondering what the heck a conoculation is, you failed to study conoculation, let us know. Definitely want to hear it if you guys are stumped or stuck. <laughs> Wonderful comment from somebody in the live group. To be fair, if I were to see this question on the GMAT, I would curse first and solve next. Exactly. Okay, getting lots of agreement here, which is wonderful. And again, theme of the day. You look at this uh, Russian novel length thing, and if you actually see this on the GMAT, and by the way, I this is uh, I changed a couple things here, but it's very, very similar to an actual GMAT question that showed up on the GMAT prep. Uh, well, what's going on? Uh, you can have that reaction. Oh, I haven't studied even conogulations. That wasn't in my test prep book. Well, that's rough. Uh, and yes, exactly. Somebody just commented that the GMAT is a fear invoking test. And my point today is, it's, at least in this aspect, when you get these crazy terminologies on, on quant, it shouldn't be. Don't let it scare you. Don't let it intimidate you. If you don't know how to answer the question, fine, but give it a minute. Give it a read. Give it a second read. What's a conogulation? I don't know. It's a word I made up. So a uh, number of even conogulations, but it's defined for you. It's the number of consecutive terms for which the product is even. Well, what does that mean? So in any consecutive pair of terms, is there at least one even? Great. Well, I've got one here. Just tally them up. I got another one here. That's two. I got another one here. That's three. I got another one here. That's four. And that's all this question is. That's it. And again, I'm not being creative. Like I, I mess around with the wording just a little bit, but this is almost exactly the type of thing you see on the test all the time. There's a question that talks about variation in sign. I've never seen that outside of the GMAT. I think they made it up. There's the prime length. Maybe that's a thing. I've never heard of it. There's one about Armstrong numbers we're going to do in a little bit. Um, so this is a thing. Don't get scared by it. Let's do one more question. Here's your Russian novel. Good luck, everybody. Awesome, we got some B's and D's and E's and a whole lot of silence from the live group. <clears throat> Don't be shy if you're stuck, let me know. Maybe some of you are trying to do calculus. 
We got an A in here too. We've got everything but C. Do I have any takers for C? I feel like an auctioneer stuck. Thank you. Thank you for telling me you're stuck. Super helpful. Lots of question marks, lots of stuck. Um, one last quick question. Um, even if you don't have an answer, that's great. Um, so my question for you guys is, how many of you are trying to do calculus? If you are, just say me in the, the live chat. I'm really curious if anybody's trying to go down that road. Anybody trying calculus? Lots of stuck. Yeah. Cool. All right. Welcome to the GMAT, everybody. So th th <laughs> the really silly thing about this question is I swear it's really not that bad. Okay, I got, got a couple people doing calculus, or at least one. Um, there's that temptation, right, if you're well-trained in math. By the way, I haven't taught calculus in, I don't know, in any real depth in 10 years. Like, I would never look at this and and really think to do that because it's, it's my background way, way back undergrad, but it's been a long, long time. Um, and by the way, the GMAT doesn't test, there's no calculus, there's no trigonometry. Um, it's really meant to kind of test grade grade nine, grade 10 math, at least sort of in the um, you know US realm of mathematics. We really don't go past grade 10. Other parts of the world, it's more like not going past grade eight. Their whole thing is they're taking these basics, these foundations, these grade eight, grade nine, grade 10 things, combining them into funny puzzles that are hard to solve really, really intimidate at you. <laughs> it's really fun. Somebody's got to give me a play by play of their calculus. Love it. Um, but it, if you go down that road, you're missing the point. Um, and thank you for letting me bait you into it. What's the question here? When you really boil it down, take a moment, read the question twice, try to distill what do they really, really, really want from me for which interval. So we're looking just at these five discrete intervals. That's it is the average rate of decrease in cost the least? Okay. So what we could do here is we could go down this road where we take every single interview interval and we calculate the, the change, the percent change, the rate of change, average rate of change. So that, that maybe gets kooky. It's an unlinear function, blah, blah, blah. But I could go, all right, well, I'm gonna take this 81, this difference of 81. And, and maybe the simplest way to do it is just take the 81 divided by 25,000. That gives me some kind of rate. And then I can take this next one here and uh, subtract those two. And what do we get? 54 plus 19. So what's that? 73 over 25,000, uh, sorry, over 24,000. 919. And right now, if this is what you're doing, or if you're watching me do it, alarm bells should be going off in your head because what a pain in the butt. Like this is never the, the type of math that you want to be doing on the GMAT where it's this many annoying little numbers or annoying big numbers. I'm missing the point. I must be missing the point. If I start doing crazy long division, if I'm going to do that five times, I'm missing the point. I'm totally missing it, right? I'm going to keep going anyway. So 846 minus 781, what do we have there? Uh, I think that's going to give us 65 over whatever. Now notice, these denominators aren't going down by much, not going down by much at all. In the scheme of things, that 80 or 70 or 65 is pretty tiny compared to the 25,000. Your denominators don't really matter here. This becomes an estimation question. And what's it really about? All you have to do is some subtraction. What do we get between in this interval from 30 to 40? So that looks like 57 to me. Somebody yell if I'm getting the math wrong. And what about this last one that looks like 49? There you go. That's the smallest decrease. Therefore, in this case, it's the smallest rate of decrease because those denominators aren't changing much. And that's all you have to do. And this is classic GMAT. So very, very typical thing. So one of the things, if you've seen any of these uh, other quant videos, one of the things I say all the time is the GMAT's all about choices. You might have six different ways to solve a mid-level question. That's their style. That's their shtick. And what they're testing you on is, can you find the easiest way to do it? So if you find yourself drowning in those numbers, you're barking up the wrong tree, you're missing something, right? If you're doing calculus, you're barking up the wrong tree. In this case, if you're solving this ugly quadratic in some way, missing the point, because all you need to do is get those, essentially those percent changes. The numbers are huge. You should think, hmm, could probably estimate something here. And once you recognize that this is just five really simple subtraction problems, that's it. And your answer is the interval from 40 to 50, and you're done really no hard work required once you get through that initial intimidation. Very, very typical. Okay. Let's go for one more. Oops.
Oops. This one's an old classic. So the reaction I get to this a lot of the time is like, I haven't studied mileage tables. And I love it. I'm getting some good comments from the live group. This can't be a real question. Actually, this is a, this is, I didn't make this one up. I, I did mess around with some of these, but um, I, was, I was very, very careful with today's lesson to take stuff that's either um, from official sources or very, very close to them. And again, live group, let me know if you're stuck. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I am full of all kinds of errors today. Made all those jokes about the back button and the delete button, and I really needed it today. So thank you, everybody, for pointing out. That's my third excellent error of the day. Um, so what I was trying to say is uh, a lot of people look at this and go, hey, I didn't study mileage tables. They're actually doing you a favor here by asking you to extrapolate it out to 30 things and not just eight. If this were eight cities instead of 30 cities, you might be really tempted to say, all right, let me just draw out the whole thing, expand this out a little bit further, and then I'm gonna count them by hand. And that's when you get absolutely wrecked, right? So you know you can't do that here. They're, <laughs> they're doing you a favor. Um, so this is all about pattern recognition and figuring out, okay, what's the pattern here? What's the pattern here? Huge thing the GMAT's testing, right? Again, how do they take eighth grade, ninth grade, 10th grade math, combine it into stuff that's hard, combine it into stuff that takes people with, economics and physics degrees and killer careers and great, great quant backgrounds and annihilate you guys. How do they do that? Uh, they do a great job with it uh, by taking this stuff and saying, well, let's make you find a pattern in it, right? And can you take the time to find the pattern? All right, so here we go. We've got dots here, 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 here. So basically what we're saying for each city pair, there's only gonna be one dot. You don't want the redundant dot here, right? So this is from city A to city B. This is from city A to city B. We don't need any of these. That doesn't do us any good. So that's basically what they're saying. So if we extrapolate this out to 30 rows and 30 columns, what do we have? We end up with 30 times 30. That's going to give you 900 boxes total in this case. Great. Well, now there's just two things you have to recognize. Thing one. You're not going to have a number from city A to city A or from city B to city B or city C to city three, city C to city C. So you're subtracting out 30, which is your diagonals. You can think of those as the city to itself. The mileage there is zero. There's no reason to put anything there. So now we've got 870. And what does that give us? 
that gives us everything except for these center things. So now what do we have? Well, everything is reflected perfectly. This is city A to city B, same here. City C to city A, same here. So now we have this, think of it as redundancy factor. Half of these boxes are giving you identical information. Everything would be doubled. So all I have to do is take that 870, divide it by two, and there you go, 435. Classic GMAT, intimidating, kooky table, and then at the end of the day, it's really not that bad. Okay, let's do one more. I think I warned you guys about Armstrong numbers earlier. Um, the odds I make a mistake on the arithmetic as we get this problem is really, really high, but because um, <laughs> I'm on a roll today. But I, I love this question. It's a fairly, it's one I just came up in um, one of the newer guides. Um, I think it's fantastic, really intimidating, and really not that bad, I swear. And if you're stuck, please let us know. I'm getting agreement from the live group, I just don't have that many people saying much. If you're stuck real quick, let us know. I'll give you 20 more seconds. All right, cool. Uh, before I launch into this mess, had a good question on the previous one. Somebody pointed out, well, yeah, you could just take 30, choose two, because you're asking the question, how many pairs of two are there among these 30 cities? Totally spot on, absolutely correct. You can totally do it that way. Um, the reason I chose to do it the other way, again, theme of today is you're getting intimidated by the phrasing, you're getting intimidated by the length, and you have this reaction that says, I didn't study that thing. And absolutely right, if you know how the combinatorics work, and absolutely you should, uh, if you're ready for your GMAT. Pretty easy once you figure out how it works. And that's in arguably a much more elegant solution than mine. My point though is, even if you don't know anything about combinatorics and you don't make that particular connection, as long as you take a breath, take your time, you can get through it. Again, very, very typical GMAT, multiple ways to do things, totally typical. Okay, back to this Armstrong number stuff. I don't know about you, I had never heard of Armstrong numbers. They, they apparently are a real thing in mathematics. I Googled it, um, had never heard of them until I ran into this GMAT question. 
Um, so I read the first part of it and I go, I don't know what the bleep you're saying. Uh, the, an end digit, an Armstrong number is an end digit number that is equal to the sum of the nth power of individual digits. Uh, I have no idea what I just said. Okay, well, let's get to the example. Oh, fine, three digits. We raise each of those digits to the third power. You add up those sums and you get the number itself. Cool, no problem. So you might look at this and go, oh, so I'm getting people saying, ah, oh, I would need four minutes to do this. Well, it's not necessarily that bad. There's a little arithmetic here, I think. There's probably ways around it. I'm gonna do it a little bit of a slower way. And say, so, well, okay, what's this? So what we're saying is that it's a four digit number. So we're saying that one to the fourth plus six to the fourth plus k to the fourth plus four to the fourth needs to be equal to this thing. 1600 and change ends in a four. Well, okay, we, we have some ugly math here. So uh, what do we have? We have one to the fourth, that's just one. That's not so ugly. Six to the fourth, that's 36 squared. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. I think that's 1296. We still have our k to the fourth. And we have our four to the fourth, which I believe is 256. Again, somebody please yell at me if I have that, that wrong. And absolutely, there's a hint in the units digit here too. So okay, if we add these guys up, uh, where, where do we land? We end up at like 150, 1,500 something, something, right? I, I think it's 53. Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. And I'm not even sure you need to be that precise. So people are pointing out that this, you don't need to be this precise with it. Absolutely, that's true. Let's say you don't see that. It's not that awful to get to these numbers. And you go, okay, I'm going to add K to the fourth to that, and I'm going to get 16, 1,600 something. So what do we know? Well, K to the fourth has to be pretty small. So k to the fourth has to give us something between, and I'm ignoring the units digit for a moment here. Um, so k has to give you something, or k to the fourth here has to give you something that's between 47 and 147. And people are pointing out, can't we calculate based on the units digit alone? Pretty much, pretty close. But you're also looking for something here. k to the fourth has to give you something with units digit of one. Now, to be fair, there are multiple things that will get you a unit digit of one. One to the fourth gives you a unit digit of one. That doesn't work. What about three to the fourth? Gives you a unit digit of one as well. That works. Uh, and that's our winner, right? And I think nine to the fourth does as well, if I'm not mistaken. So you've got different options. I'm not sure you can use unit digit alone, but using a combination of estimation and the unit digit, really not bad. We need something that's kind of three digits-ish, maybe low four digits and gives you unit digit of one. It's gotta be three. Three to the fourth gives you 81. And nothing else could possibly work. Five to the fourth isn't gonna do it. One to the fourth isn't gonna do it. So K has to be three and that's that. So not so bad, very, very typical. So yeah, people are pointing out hints in the units digit. And even if you don't pick up on that immediately, you need to at some point, it helps a lot. Even if you just do the arithmetic, really not bad. Maybe one ugly piece of arithmetic there and that's it. Okay, if I'm not mistaken, I think the next question I have here, uh, my next two are going to come from the GMAT prep. Um, so if you have not done your GMAT prep exams, you might want to skip these two. Uh, or, And if you've already exhausted the GMAT preps or you don't mind seeing one question that could appear, go ahead and stick with us. I have two more questions from those. Time permitting, i got a couple bonus questions too I might get to. I love this guy. One of my favorite inside the mind of the GMAT kind of questions. So take a moment. And again, it's from the GMAT prep. So if this isn't your cup of tea, you might want to leave us now. If you're trying to leave those GMAT preps pristine. And if you are leaving us, thank you for joining. And for the rest of you, please let me know what you think.
live group comments are coming in pretty slowly. Don't be shy. If you're stuck, let us know. Ooh, we're getting some variety. We got some uh, answer choices that aren't there. Maybe I screwed up the answer choices. Who knows? So we've got uh, 60, we got 87, we got 81, we got D, we got A. Love it. We got some retractions. Don't retract. We're happy to see it when you're struggling. Happy to get you to struggle less as well. Okay. So again, the reaction I get all the time. This is one of the questions uh, from the GMAT prep exams that I think I see the most mistakes on. Uh, relative to somebody's skill level. So again, odds and evens, no big deal. A little bit of multiplication, no big deal. Uh, see errors on this all the time. I think it it is probably considered a difficult question because so many people miss it. Uh, absolutely phenomenal in terms of getting inside the mind of the GMAT. Doesn't look maybe as bad unless you're intimidated by the notation. By now, if you've been with us for the seven or eight questions we've done, you look at this and go, ah, it's just a function question. They gave me a notation. I need to pick, just follow the directions, follow the directions. That's it. Great. Okay. What's well, nine inside the box? Um, and by the way, in the actual test, I couldn't create boxes here, but these were inside boxes for what it's worth. So M inside a box is equal to 3M when M is odd. Well, great. So the nine inside the box must be equal to 27. Six inside the box, you take that even number, it's equal to one half of the thing inside the box. So that's gonna give you three. Great, so 27 times three is equal to 81. And we are done, the answer's A. Am I right? Am I right? Did I check my work? Except the answer choice is, that's not 81. A actually says 81 inside the box. Well, what's 81 inside the box? Well, it's odd, so it's equal to 3m. So that's actually 243. That's not what we got. What about 54? Well, that's actually equal to 27. Even number inside the box. 37, I'm not going to mess with. Wrong ballpark. What about 27? That's an odd number. So 27 times 3, that gives us 81. GMAT dirty tricks division. Really, really good stuff. So again, don't get intimidated by the notation. And one of the things, if you've been to a lot of these broadcasts on the quant stuff, especially our GMAT mindset videos we did back in 2018, one of the things I say all the time, read the question twice, plot your path forward before you go, think through it a little bit. When you're done, read one more time, make sure you're not walking into some sort of trap, making the kind of mistakes maybe you've made before. So take that moment. It's really easy to lunge here and go, yeah, yeah, yeah I got it. Let me move on to the next thing. Take a moment, see if there's something funny going on. So what happens most of the time here is you just don't notice that these aren't the actual numbers. These are the numbers inside a box. A little bit dirty, but for whatever reason, the GMAT loves to test you on, are you paying attention? That's the game you're playing. Take that moment at the end. Don't leap as soon as you get an answer that you think is right. All right, we've got one more. This is another one of my all-time favorites, our only data sufficiency entry of the day. And this is it, last one for today, keeping this one short. And special welcome to Shovik and the Night King. I think that's the name of a Indian ska band.
All right, good. Looks like nobody's struggling in that live group. And I'm getting a warning message. By the way, this is our very first time. We are live on both YouTube and Facebook. So first time for GMAT Club on Facebook. So we're going to be regularly doing these live broadcasts on both Facebook and YouTube. I think we're having tech problems on Facebook today. Uh, but for what it's worth, if you prefer to watch our content on Facebook, we're going to be there too. All right, live group did wonderfully here, I think. Not getting intimidated. It's one of the nice things. By the time we get to the end of these lessons, people start to kind of get the idea. It's fantastic. All right. So what's going on here? Word soup, intimidating equation. And as some of the people in live group have pointed out, well, you got these four variables. Oh, it's really ugly, but what's the key? We know that John and Sue have the same interest rate. They have the same number of monthly installments. So what's the difference? Well, basically, once you recognize that R is the same for both of them, so this is fixed, that's a constant, this is a constant, the N is a constant. So let's talk about this denominator. This denominator, same for both of them, has absolutely nothing to do with the answer. Fantastic. What about up top here? Well, the R, also a constant. It's the same for both of them. So there's really only one thing that matters. It's up in the numerator, multiplicative. It's just the P. So what's our question? John's monthly payment is what percent of Sue's monthly payment? So what we want to know is M for John is equal to what percentage? So is there some little multiplier there of Sue's monthly payment? So before you even get to those answer choices, if you can recognize that all we're looking for is what's the percent difference in their principal amounts, that's it. And what do you know? Statement one gives that to you on a silver platter. Sue's monthly payment, or sorry, Sue's principal is four times John's principal, exactly what you were looking for. And then two actually just gives it to you basically. So Sue's monthly installment is four times John's monthly installment. Done, answer must be D. Quick and painless if you don't freak out. This is one of those questions where, um, I hear really, really often, oh, I saw that and I just skipped it because it was too long. So bottom line today, I think we're gonna wrap up because I, I think I'm gonna pass on those bonus questions. Um, so bottom line for today, one of the things I see all the time, you know you're gonna be time pressured on the GMAT unless you're some sort of superhuman freak, in which case, what are you doing watching our videos? Uh, you're more superhuman and smarter than I am. Look at the mistakes I made today. I had muting problems, I had typos, I had math errors. I decided that three plus two minus two was five. So if you're superhuman like that, get out of here. You're intimidating me. Unless you're a freak of nature, you're gonna have time pressure on the GMAT on quant, even if you're great at it, right? You can never spend as much time as you want. So one of the things that gets into people's heads is I'm gonna skip the long ones. I'm gonna skip the long ones. I'm gonna skip the crazy ones. My point today is take a moment, take a deep breath. You see something that's long, it's intimidating. It's a Russian novel, it's a Martian novel, whatever your reaction is to it. It's got symbols you've never seen. It's got terminology you've never seen. Take a breath, read it twice. Breathe a little bit before you start writing stuff down. Odds are good, it's not always gonna be true, but odds are good that that long, wordy, pain in the butt, intimidating, weird symbol filled question really isn't that bad. Again, it's a design feature. Why is the GMAT testing you on how intimidated you get doing quant questions? I don't know, but as long as you can get your mind right and learn how to not be intimidated, take a deep breath. The longer it is, the quicker it falls. So with that in mind, that's it for today. Have fun studying everybody. This Friday, uh, back to verbal, we're gonna be doing a video on critical reasoning, fill in the blank questions, fairly straightforward topic. One nice intuitive thing we're going to have you do, work through maybe half a dozen questions. So that's 8.30 Pacific this coming Friday. And then next week, Word Problem Bootcamp Part 4, Counting Set Series, 8.30 a.m. Pacific, 9 o'clock p.m. Indian time. And number nine, last one of the series, next Friday, that's going to be, this is one I've been looking forward to. It's going to be on countable and non-countable modifiers on GMAT sentence correction. So join us for those last three. Huge thanks to everybody who's been with us live because I love getting your feedback. Thank you for correcting me when I muted, made mistakes. Love it, love it. Again, thank you everybody for joining us and we'll see you on the forums.